Okay. Yeah, we'll do it differently from the way we did it the other day. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Good and afternoon. Now I'm about to humiliate myself. How many people were at the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center to see and listen to Terrence on Friday night? Okay. Well, okay. you missed. We showed uh, two of uh, two films with Terrence's scores: one Spike Lee, one not Inside Man, and uh, Talk to Me. And uh, did some good Q and A after that. Yeah, it was very nice. We had a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but here we're talking about blowing, and we have young people with instruments in hand. Yeah, so I want to. It is, as they say in Alice in Wonderland, it is best to begin at the beginning. Talk about practice. Mm. Uh, but first, let me ask you a very specific question. Sure. When you were, let's say, in high school, how many hours a day did you practice? Uh, you know what, I never really timed it, but I'll give you an example of what we used to do. Uh, and the reason why I never timed it, because it was, we learned very quickly that it was not about the amount of hours that you put in, but it was the, the amount of focus, you know, that you were given to whatever it is you were practicing. And we also knew that you had to, pra you had to break up your practicing. So, you know, I, I stretched my practicing throughout the course of the day. Um, I, I played in concert band at my high school, so I would try to get to rehearsal early to do some of my warm-ups and some of my lip drills and, you know, just certain very fundamental exercises, tightening my corners and stuff like that, and then have the rehearsal with the, with the band. I'd come back during my lunch break and try to do some other types of flexibility exercises and stuff like that, maybe some characteristic exercises. Then we were shipped to the Arts High School, have class there, and then after class, I would do some other types of exercises, technical exercises, go through some etudes or whatever. And then if I had, I had rehearsals with other groups, sometimes I worked with the Daishiki Theater, so sometimes I would have rehearsals with them. If not, I'd go home, do my homework, and then practice my jazz stuff late at night. So we're talking about several hours a day. Yes, I mean, but we never, but we never tried to say, oh man, I practice six hours a day. You know, because, and the reason why I think that's important is because I know some people get hung up on the, to the amount of time that you practice. So I've seen people sit down and try to practice for an hour and do nothing for an hour. You know, they just go through the motions. I had a friend of mine, when we were in college, this guy, he called himself practicing, and basically what he would do, he was, he was, and he was, he was a nut. Let me just <laughs> say it, because he was crazy, man. He would come over to your apartment, and he said, "Man, I, let me use the bathroom." I said, "Okay, fine." But he would go in your bathroom and pull out a, uh, uh, what do you call it, like the fake book, mm -hmm. and then he would start playing through tunes in your bathroom. <laughs> but the thing about it was, I, and the reason why I say that is that he thought he was practicing, but he wasn't practicing, he was just playing through the tunes. He wasn't really focused on trying to accomplish a goal, okay? I want to work on my tongue in here, so let me do these exercises for my tongue. I want to work on my breathing here, so let me do these exercises for that. I want to work on my flexibility or tightening my corners. There's certain things you have to do for that. Then you may do some exercises that incorporates all of those things into some kind of characteristic, that's why they're called characteristic studies. You want to deal with the certain characteristics of playing your instrument that'll help you to be able to, to phrase in a clear and concise manner when you improvise. You know, that's the type of practicing that you need to, to, to pay attention to. So, and you'll find that you probably will practice longer than that way than any other way. I think the, <clears throat> I think the thing about it, with practicing, Really, what you have to do is to come to terms with what it is you can't do and what it is you need to do to get there. That's what practicing is really about. Because, you know, sometimes we like to cheat it and we say, oh, I practiced for the day. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you did and you really accomplished anything if you just went through the motions. If you sit there and you say to yourself, man, I really want to be able to do this, and I know I can't, but let me just start here, and you start, you're going to really see the amount of time that you're going to have to put in to reach those goals. And sometimes that it can look like an insurmountable task, but it's not. The thing is, you have to, like most people say, you have to set long-term goals and short-term goals. So you have to make sure you accomplish those short-term goals that are in accordance with the long-term goals that you're trying to accomplish overall. So there's, there's a real 
not surprisingly, I guess, psychological aspect to practicing. Because for, for most of us, you think, you say the word practice uh, as a non-musician, but in almost any kind of field, you take practice and people go, oh. Right, right, exactly. And the reason why people, it, it's mostly psychological. You know, Herbert L. Clark was a great classical trumpet player who wrote this, these books, Technical Studies and the Characteristic Studies. He had a saying. He said, hit him hard and wish him well. <laughs> yeah, that's when he was talking about playing the trumpet. He said, hit him uh. hard and wish him well. <laughs> you know, what I'm, in, in other words, you have to psych yourself up to say, okay, I'm going to hit that note, or I'm going to practice what I need to practice. You know, because the thing is, you guys know, y'all know I'm telling the truth, right? When you sit down and practice, you say, oh man, okay, let me get to this, let me work on this exercise. And as soon as you start, your fingers don't do what they're supposed to do, right? So you go, well, damn, let me break that down and start, and you start to see that that's going to take a little longer than what you thought. Then all of a sudden you realize, well, wait a minute, I need to take in more air. So then that's breathing, you're going to have to work on that and say, damn, okay, then I'm going to get that together. Then you got to articulate, there's some phrase, you got to do 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 right? You say, wait, that's not smooth. So you start to see the list starts to build, <laughs> right? So it has nothing to do with the physical part of it. The physical part of it is just you going through the motions of doing it and paying attention to what it is that you're doing. It's really the psychological part of it, saying that, okay, I know that there's a lot of stuff for me to tackle, but the thing is, if I start, every day I do it, I'm closer to my goal. Every day I don't do it, I'm further away from my goal. And, and, and this is, this is the, the, the challenge that I always give you know, students. I always tell them all the time, I said, look, do me a favor. I just did it to one of my students at the Monk Institute. Hopefully she's doing that right now. I need to call her, you know, give her one of those unexpected calls. Uh, you're practicing. <laughs> you know. This is the telephonic foot in the ass. <laughs> exactly. I, I live for those calls. From the <laughs> I used to get those, man, my teacher. I still get them. I Bill mean, you, Fielder. you use them. You still need somebody to keep you on it. Right? Of course, man. <laughs> um, but one of the things I, I, I told her, and I tell you guys this, Okay, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, let's just do a test. Practice everything you're supposed to practice the way you're supposed to practice for one week. Just do it for one week. That's not a long time. Just do it for one week. Just commit yourself to getting up and doing everything that you're supposed to do every day for seven days. And I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, it's just, I'm just as sure as the sun rises every day and sets that you will feel the difference at the end of the seven days. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the trip about it to me. I usually do this after the week, but I'm not going to be here for a week, so I'm going to tell you this right off. Okay, when you finish that after a week, multiply that by four and think about where you'd be after a month and then just do the math. Multiply it by 16. See where you would think about where you would be after four months of doing that. And here's the other analogy that really scared me to death about practicing. Well, there was two. The first one was you don't have to practice because there's somebody on this planet practicing right now. <laughs> Somewhere. That's true. We don't know. We don't know the person. We probably will in the coming future. Right. <laughs> we don't know him. But right now, at this moment, somebody's doing everything they're supposed to be doing. So you don't have to practice. That's okay. Go ahead and just hang out and chill and have a good time. Um, but the, here's the one that really got me. My teacher said, he said, look, man. He said, nobody never stands still. You never stand still. You either moving forward. Oh, I'm sorry in your case. <laughs> you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. And the reason for that is because while you think you're standing still, the earth is rotating and time is moving on while you think you're standing still. So while everybody else is moving forward, you're actually falling behind. It's, it's true and it, it, there's something that I hadn't thought of. One of the things we celebrate in jazz particularly is the spirit of competition and the fact that competition makes, tends to make artists better. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's true in comedy writing, it's true. I mean, you're, you're collegial with your with colleagues, and, but at a certain point, I mean, if you write like 
in this building, uh, I work on the Mark Twain Prize every year, and at a certain point, yeah, all the comedy writers are backstage, but you want to kill right. out on stage, and we oh, yeah. use metaphors yeah. like that. But that really begins even with practice, that competition, right? You're competing against somebody who could be halfway around the world who's practicing more than you are. Yeah, but when you're younger, when you're younger, that's a, that's a motivation that's used. I guess now, at the age that I am now, um, for me, it's all about practicing and I'm competing against myself. I'm competing against myself, and I know that's a cliche that everybody, you know, everybody uses, but it's really true. And the thing is, I'm competing against myself because I've gotten to this age and this stage in my career. I don't want to get to the, another stage, let's say next year, and have regrets. I just don't want to have it. I want to give it my all. I want to, I don't want, I want to be able, I don't want to be able to say I could have, would have, should have, you know what I'm saying? I want to I want to be able to say look it just wasn't for me. I'd rather have that experience knowing that I put all of my energy into it than to sit back and become bitter because I've had the the I guess uh, in a weird way the good fortune of of <laughs> running into some guys early in my life who were very bitter. Mm. You know, and I I saw what that did to them and now I'm not going to have that experience. You know, at the end of the day, when it's time to turn the lights on on me, uh, hopefully I'll be able to look back and say, well, I try to do as many things as I've ever thought I could do. And the, that whole idea of, well, it's different now from what it, we speak now of jazz specifically. It's different now from what it would have been mm -hmm. even 40 or 50 years ago when, you know, people were doing studio work in New York, people were playing in clubs every night, people were on the road with bands, and so you were playing all the time. Nowadays, the marketplace being what it is, the art of jazz and, and the commerce of jazz being what it is, is it practice that keeps you in shape? I mean, there aren't jam sessions every night. There you're, not, you're not playing in front of the public every night, right? No, I mean, but the thing that keeps me in shape, oddly enough, is uh, the band that I have. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate enough where I have some great guys in the band. And when we do go on the road, these guys challenge me nightly, which is another reason that makes me practice, you know, because these guys will throw some stuff at you. And they don't, and they don't, they're not doing it in a mean way, you know, that's just how they are. Yeah. You know, they, they come up with these ideas and they're like, okay, man, what about this? And they start playing things, and I'm like, what? <laughs> but you can't stop on the bandstand. No, it's true. <laughs> you have to keep going. You're in the middle of the game. So it starts to make me realize, okay, well, like, and I'll give you an example. When I first started hiring these young guys that I've had in my band for the last five or six years with Eric Harlan and uh, uh, Edward Simon and all of those guys, those guys started playing odd meter stuff, right? And they would do it, man, like they were playing Mary Had a Little Lamb or you know, or, or, or Jingle Bells or something. It was just that easy to them. And I wasn't as adept at it as they were, but man, they used to throw it at me all the time, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is my band. <laughs> 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 Something's gotta change. So I never wanted to be the type of band leader co to curtail their creative spirit. Right. So I wasn't gonna say, don't play that, because I, you know, you know, I ain't into that. You know, that, not that kind of thing. My thing is, okay, I look at it from a spiritual point of view where I'm being given a glimpse into this world for a reason. So if I'm being given a glimpse into this world, let me go and investigate this. And as a result, it's broadened my experiences musically. You know, so I think you know, when it comes to all of this stuff, you, you, we were talking about this earlier. One of the things I think you guys should understand is that in the midst of practicing and trying to develop, you always have to keep your eyes open to all of the possibilities that are in front of you. Because, you know, how do I say this? Like, when, when I was a kid, and I listened to Miles Davis and Clifford Brown, I had this vision of what the jazz world would be. Or I had this vision of what it was. And, you know, when I got to New York, I was looking for that. And that didn't exist. And it kind of blew me away, because I kept feeling like I missed something. You know, I kept feeling like I wasn't a part of something. But then it took me a moment to realize that I'm a part of now, you know? And now is valid. What's going on now, this is our statement that we're making. 
I kept looking in the past, that's not going to come back. It's only a reflection of where we were and what happened. You all, in the midst of practicing and trying to get better, you always got to keep your eyes open to what's going on in front of you. Because the analogy that was given to me was, was, uh, was, was the one of a person driving a car at night on the highway, on a two-lane highway with no lights on the, on the road. The only lights you have are the lights on your car, right? You drive with confidence knowing that the road is in front of you, only being able to see maybe 20 or 30 yards in front of you. But you still continue on, and you don't look back. So that's the analogy that I use for, for my career. You know, like people say, what do you see yourself doing, you know, 10 years from now? And I have visions of doing things 10 years from now, but, you know, it's, it, it'll all change. It'll all change. It'll all change because something will pique my curiosity, you know? And the other thing, too, is while you have those long-term goals, don't etch them in stone, please. Because life will be so boring if you knew everything you're going to do for the next 10 years. Well, and you might, more is the point, you might you miss an opportunity, especially yeah. if you work on the, what, what the father of one friend of mine called the exciting creative cusp of life. Hmm. This usually means not making money. Well, I was but, going to say rent. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, you, if you... If you are, have this like fixed idea that this is what your art is and nothing else, then something that could have pulled you in a really progressive direction, uh, you may miss it. You know? I, I, man, I feel so bad when I go to Berkeley and when I go to all of these schools and I go to the film department. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, man, how do I become a film composer? <laughs> and I go, dude, I don't know. <laughs> you, really, you know, because I had no aspirations of being a film composer, right. none whatsoever. I had no aspirations of being an educator. I was going to be Miles Davis. Yeah. I was going to walk around. I wasn't going to do interviews. Everybody was just going to be mystified by everything that I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that was going to be my career, and I was going to be cool. But when none of that happened, man, I was, <laughs> I was shaking to my core. It was like, well, damn, what do I do now? It's funny. <laughs> The, the, one, being Miles Davis, the jokes write themselves. Okay, anyway, um, but this gets into something else that I think is very important, especially for young musicians and just for those of us who are our listeners. Um, you mentioned the past. Still, one has to learn the language of jazz, right? One has to know one's Roy Eldridge and one has to know... Well, and for, it, as, as Coleman Hawkins often pointed out, people think that because you're a tenor saxophonist, you're influenced by other tenor saxophonists. No, I've been influenced by drummers. I've been influenced by pianists. You know? right. um, so how do you, especially as a developing young musician, what guides would you give us? We've talked about practicing. Mm -hmm. How does one listen? Well, I, I, I liken it to learning another language. You know, I, I, if you're going to learn French, the main thing is you have to learn pronunciation. You have to learn vocabulary, and you have to learn grammar, word usage. And that's the very fundamental core of learning French. But you're still not speaking French until you start to visit those countries and start to pick up dialects, start to pick up well, colloquialisms. You know what I mean? Um, and that's listening to the records. You know, um, when I, and I would caution you, um, OK. This is a controversial topic for some of my colleagues, but this is my own personal belief. I do believe that you need to learn the history of jazz. I do. You know, but here's the thing about it. <clears throat> you don't learn the history of jazz at the expense of who you are. You feel me? Like, you don't listen to those records and say, I got to be able to play all of that before I can be me. Because nobody in the history of jazz has ever done that. And I, will, and I always say, point to me to somebody that has. Now, Clifford Brown definitely came out of Fashion Navarro. You know what I mean? Miles Davis, early Miles Davis, you definitely can hear Dizzy Gillespie and Pops, right? Bird, you can hear Don Bias. Somebody came from somewhere, definitely. So my thing is, you know, <clears throat> take a... You know, I, t I tell this to, to people who are just starting. Take one CD and listen to the one CD. I think you can learn more from listening to that one CD 
it goes back to, again, to that thing of practicing. I think you can learn more by listening to that one CD than by trying to listen to the whole entire history of jazz and not ever really paying attention to any of it. You know what I mean? Just trying to, it's like cramming for a test. You know, when you cram for a test, you have that information for a week. <laughs> and then two weeks later, you can't remember none of that stuff. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> I think, but at the same time, you have to learn the fundamentals. So when you learn those fundamentals of French, and then you start to go to these countries to, learn, to pick up all of these dialects, then you have to figure out what it is you need to say. <laughs> you just don't want to mimic what they say. <laughs> so you have to experiment. You have to converse. You have to interact. That's playing, you know? So <clears throat> once you start to understand and get a handle on it, you still have to really be comfortable with who you are, what it is that you have to say. You never throw that away. Never, never. And, and, and I'm a, uh, uh, I, I hate instructors that do that. You know, um, we had a, we had, we've had students at the Monk Institute who do things in a very unconventional manner. But the thing is, they're making music. So who am I to tell them, okay, man, don't do that. We need to learn how to play two, five, one changes in a proper form. It's crazy. If we did that, we wouldn't have to learn this month. I was just gonna use that as an, that's exactly right. <laughs> right, you know exactly. what I mean? So you, you, you at this, <clears throat> being a jazz artist, it's kind of a weird kind of existence. So on the one hand, you have to know what has come before you. And, uh, and the analogy, <laughs> that I've, I've used there is that you, you may as well just sit down and listen to some of that stuff and learn some of the history, because you know you may take 20 years to learn what you could have learned in two weeks if you just listen to the right thing. <clears throat> but at the same time, experiment. Try something. Go out there and do your own thing. Don't let, let anybody make you feel like you're not prepared to do that. Now, there may be technical challenges. There may be fundamental challenges in terms of knowing harmony, knowing your scales, you know all of that stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about as far as that's concerned. Being able to make, make music in the proper functional form. You know, not playing something out of the, out of the core change and calling yourself hip. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wayne does that because Wayne knows what he's doing. That's the difference, you know? I know some people who just never really learned it and they say, oh man, well, this is my style. I'm like, no. Right. You know, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> That's an important point. And citing Wayne Shorter is a, 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 a real good, good example. The one of the things it seems to me that listening to that stuff can do. I, in fact, I, I had this conversation once with with Marcus Roberts, and he say, you know, people will listen to uh, Beethoven or. Art Tatum, and they'll say, well, you know, I don't really need to get to that, hmm. because, you know, what I'm doing is every bit as valid right. as what Beethoven did or what Art Tatum did. It's just, it's just different, that's all. <laughs> to which Marcus said, no, it ain't. It's not as good, <laughs> right? right. And, right. And, right? And it's very important to listen to that stuff to understand right. Right. what you're up against. Right. You know, I mean, as a writer of comedy, I mean, mm -hmm. I would probably give my life to have written one scene of something that Moliere wrote Mm -hmm. 300 years ago, right? Yeah. But 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. But you know, you may not get to that. But mm -hmm. unless you are familiar with it mm -hmm. and know it, you'll never get the most out of yourself and well, know who you are. Well, just think about somebody if, who would come up here right now with a with a with a thick Russian accent and would speak English and would just string together words that made no sense. <clears throat> And he would tell you, yeah, but that's cool, man, but that's my English. Right, self-expression. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to do what everybody else does. I'm different. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're ignorant, basically. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So there's that, there's that fine line between that that you have to really pay attention to, and it's very important because sometimes you can get sidelined, you can get sidetracked. You can get sidetracked by this thing that I think is a big trap. Biggest trap in being a jazz musician is when you try to be hip. That's a big trap. That's a big trap. Because when you're trying to be hip, you're not being who you are. You know what I'm saying? Like I always tell my students, the thing that, that I had to learn, like I was telling you about the Miles Davis thing, I wanted to be Miles Davis and Wayne Short. I'm telling you. That was it. Then I met Wayne Short and I said, well, damn, that, that I will never be that once I met him. You know what I mean? Because I said, my personality is totally different from his. <clears throat> But one of the biggest struggles that you're going to find being an artist is being who you are 
versus being who you want to be. Those could be, those could be two totally different things. And you have to start to reconcile that in yourself to be comfortable with yourself. You know what I mean? When I was a young artist, I never thought of myself as being a comedian. I never thought of myself as telling jokes on stage. I told you, I thought I was gonna come up there and not say a word, just play my music, and you would be so thrilled that I put the horn up to my lips, and then I would move on. That's not me. I had to realize that, you know? And once I started to realize that, then I became comfortable with it. And here's the really great part about all of that to me. Once you become comfortable with who you are, then you can appreciate everybody else without tripping. You know what I'm saying? Because you sit there and you say, man, that's how did you come up with that? It's no, it's no knock on me. You know what I mean? But prior to that, there's that, you know, the other side of that competitive thing that Murray was talking about, there's a negative part to that. Because sometimes the competitive thing is about position. It's not about artistry. It's about, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the, no. We're all different flavors. All of us. We all have different things to say. And once you, and, and uh, give you an example of that, Dizzy Gillespie, I'll never forget this man. This was, this was started to send me down this path. I was in, I was in Italy in uh, the Perugia Jazz Festival. I was in the dressing room with, with, with Dizzy Gillespie. And he was back there, we just, just warming up. You know, and he started to play this, I forgot, I can't even remember the ballad, man. But he started to play this ballad. And he stopped and he said, man, you know, Miles Davis could always play the prettiest notes. And when he said that, that blew me away because right away I, I immediately saw that he had such a high respect and appreciation for what Miles did. But in a way that let me know that he was still confident with what he had brought to the world of music. You know what I mean? So start thinking about that. Start really trying to figure that out. And trust me, it ain't going to happen overnight. So don't get discouraged. It's not gonna happen. We're talking about a lifetime of work. Lifetime, lifetime. We live in a fast food society, you know, and I think that, that, that does us such a disservice because, you know, it does us a, a disservice in the arts world So in so many ways. Young guys get signed and we expect them to be totally, you know, developed artists. It's not gonna happen. They have to go out and play. You have to develop. You have to work at your craft all the time. You have to whittle away at it all the time. You're not just going to come up here and be great all of a sudden. I mean, you can be great on a certain level, but your, your life's path should be devoted to constantly growing. Constantly. You know, when I work with Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter now, those guys, are, I did a gig with Herbie, man, we had an 11-hour rehearsal. Mm. An 11-hour <laughs> rehearsal. And the thing about it, we didn't even realize it was 11 hours. They started bringing in pizza. We were like, damn, <laughs> okay, how long we been here? <laughs> you know, and the thing that was really cool about it, the rehearsal lasted long because Herbie would get into something and he would play something and, he, and then he'd be like a little kid. Yeah. He'd say, oh man, but well, you know what, we can, uh, wait a minute, let me, let me figure this out. And then, we can, and then next thing you know, they're starting to modify arrangements. That's what you want. That's what you want. And, 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 and I'm going to say this to you, and I'm going to let him ask another question, because there's <laughs> something else that's always on my mind about this. I watched an uh, uh, interview with Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra said something that blew me away. He said, look, man, this guy asked him, he said, are you a spiritual leader, or are you a spiritual guru? He said, I'm all of those things and more, right? And he said, look, we always limit ourselves. He said, when you say I'm a doctor, all of a sudden your experience is are limited to that. You say, when I'm a you say, I'm a lawyer. All your experiences are limited to that. Don't do that as a musician. Don't say, oh man, this is my thing. Because then for the rest of your career, that's going to be your thing. You're not going to be able to move into other areas. I don't know what my thing is. I'm, I have things that I like. You know what I'm saying? But I'm constantly trying to find something else. You know, if somebody will come to me and give me something different that like piques my curiosity, I'm going after it. And I'm going to say, well, man, why don't we check this out? Man, that's hip. Do that again. But when you sit there and you say, oh, this is my thing, all of a sudden, okay, this becomes your thing. That's your thing. But what about all the other stuff in here? Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself because that, then, you're, then all of your, your, your experiences are going to be extremely narrow. 
This dovetails very well into what I was going to ask is the last question until we hear some of these young men with a horn, as somebody once wrote. Um, what about, what's the role, I don't even know quite how to ask the question, or what's the importance of non-musical education in building a musical artist? That is to say, very, and again, I'm sorry to analogize, like this is the only way as a non-musician I know how to do it. When young people come to me and they say they want to work in the, in the musical theater or they want to work in the movies and, mm -hmm. you know, how did I do that? And mm -hmm. like you, I didn't start out wanting to <laughs> do it, it just happened. Mm -hmm. But I always tell them, actually, I can quote Robert Benton, the great film director, who said uh, in our theater uh, a couple years ago, a woman came up to him and said, you know, my son really wants to be a film director. What should he do now? She said, tell him not to do anything having to do with film for 10 years. He said, go to a liberal arts college, you know, study science, study philosophy, study history, study economics, study, you know. Now, on the other hand, some people are extraordinarily talented, <coughs> and you would want them, I suppose, to go to a conservatory, but what's the role of a, a kind of broadly based education of reading, of looking at the other arts, looking at science and other things? Well, it's extremely it. important because your art doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't. You know, it, I am always constantly reminded of the fact, you know, that I'm not just a musician because when I woke up this morning, my little girls were talking about, can we go downstairs to the breakfast buffet? You know what I mean? So, I mean, that, that, that takes me out of the realm of being that hip guy I was talking about earlier. You know, then you sit there and you start to watch current events. You start to see what's going on socially. You know, I have fascinations and other things that I read about all the time. You know, and I think all of those things play a big role in how you develop as an artist. Because, be, what does it mean to be an artist? Does it mean that you're just gonna study as much music as you can <clears throat> and come out here and dazzle us with your musical prowess? No, because your music has to touch the souls and the hearts of people who are coming to hear you play. So, the thing is, all of these other things become very important because that's the common ground. That's the common area that we all vibrate and relate to, right? So, you know, it's very important to study other things. It's very important to read. It's very important to read about art, read about poets, read about painters, read about uh, other musicians and other different disciplines, classical musicians. Stay up on current events. Find out what really makes you tick as a person, not as an artist, but as a person. All of those things are very, very important. They are, they, are not, they, they, they are not two isolated things. Who you are as a person is going to have a direct effect on who you are as a musician. And I've seen it time and time and time and time again. When I see people who are not socially involved, when I see people who have no passion for anything outside of music, their music reflects that. You see what I mean? I, I, I saw Herbie do an interview years ago. Man, it blew me away, because Herbie said, I'm trying to be a better father than a better husband. Mm. And I said, well, wait a minute, dude. Well, what about the piano? What about the chord changes? <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? You know, and like, for example, uh, uh, Yvonne Lenz wrote a tune, and when I, when I asked him about it, I said, man, how did you come up with this? I tell it as a joke, but it's a, it's a true story. I said, how did you come up with this tune? He said, man, and this is a great, I don't know if you know who Yvonne Lenz is, but he's a great Brazilian uh, songwriter and vocalist. And he said, man, uh, you know, we were having dinner with my, you know, I was having dinner with my wife, and then we went down in the, to the basement of the house just to have some wine and cheese afterwards, and we were just hanging. And he said, man, she was sitting in the window, and the wind, it was a big window, and he said the window was open, and the lights were dim in the, the basement. And he said, I looked at my wife, man, and he really loves his wife, you know, dearly. And he said, she said, her face was lit by the light of the moon, and her hair was blowing in the breeze. And he said, man, and I looked at it, and this melody came to me. That has nothing to do with sitting down saying, let me find out what chord goes good with this chord here. Oh, I got a nice sound, you know, there's nothing, none of that. <clears throat> you know what I mean? He was moved in his heart, in his soul. And because he was moved, because of his, his prowess and technical ability, that allowed him to take that passion and turn it into something musical. 
You see what I'm saying? You know, it's, it's, it's like the thing that I tell musicians is that, you know, most of the people who pay to come see you, they're not journalists. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Nobody's going to sit there and say, man, that was, you heard him play that four over five? Woo, that was killing. How he juxtaposed that rhythm again? No, no. People don't, people don't, most of the people who came to the show last night, I know they weren't thinking about that. They weren't thinking about that. You know what I mean? That's what we think about. That's how we craft what, we, what it is that we do. You know, Louis Armstrong is one of the great ambassadors in American, uh, modern American musical history, right? You know, did all of these great technical things, right? But you go out and ask the average person who was really experiencing Louis back in that period, right? Nobody talks about none of that. They say, man, he really could blow that horn. That's it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or they say, man, I really love this music. He was a great entertainer. Nobody's sitting on there saying, man, you heard how he could, he could do that thing and play that, man, he played that raised nine sound on the back of that thing, man, and then he turned around and then did that pentatonic thing. Nobody does that. Only musicians do that. And I'm going to tell you what our Blakey used to say about that. Stop playing for musicians when they come to your gigs. Stop playing for them. You don't play for them. You play for people who come to hear music. Because if you're going to play for the musicians, they're going to try, first they're going to try to get in your gig free. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, you're going to have to file their hands off of one bottle of beer because that's all they're going to buy. <laughs> that's it. So they're not putting anything into the kitty. It's, very funny. it's true. It's true. And it's, uh, well, we'll hear some more specific ways of doing this now because, uh, we're, and tell you what's going to happen. We're going to hear from these three young men and then uh, take some questions from them and from you. Um, and the first up is Wesley Meyer. It says here that Wesley has lived in the DC area all his life. He's been playing trumpet for about three years. He's a jazz studies major at Howard University. He's planning to add a second major in composition. Please welcome Wesley Meyer. And I'll recuse myself a little bit and it is a master class. The master's here, so you conduct class. So, 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 how long have you been playing, man? Uh, seriously, about like maybe two or three years. Okay, good. You got a nice sound. Thanks. You got a nice sound. Uh, two things I'm, I'm noticing off the bat. We gotta, you, what we got to work with you on is getting you comfortable with core skill relationships. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know what I mean by that? <clears throat> you know, like all of those, figure out which scales work with which chords. And, yeah. Right. Well, that's one of the things I, I've just started working on. Just very recently. Okay. So, um, and w <clears throat> one of the things, I'm just going to give you a little tip. Um, anybody ever talk to you about what a seven scale is? Okay. Seven scale is a major scale with the minor and major seventh in it. That would be a so can you dominant beat up scale? Yes, play it for me. Just go on G.
Okay, all right, now, uh, another thing. Don't swing. That's a big misconception. I just heard you do it, da, 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 da. Everybody tells you to do that, right? You know, don't do that. You know, no, seriously, seriously. You know, da, 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 right? Diddly, bo, bo, be, diddly, be, diddly, be. I'm not going, da, 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 Because if you spit, spit it up, that's what it would sound like, right? That was a certain period in the music. Now people are playing even. Right? Did little, did little, bo be, little be, little bip, bip. And if you were to improvise, be did it, put be did little, be did it, 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 be See, I'm singing thing, everything I'm singing is even, not did did it, did it, did it, did it, okay? Now, but here's the biggest thing <clears throat> you have a nice sound, right? So that tells me you have a certain amount of wind capacity available to you. But here's where you're making your mistake. What you're doing is you, <clears throat> you're cutting off your air in between the phrases. You're going ta 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 right? You have to look at your air. OK. I need a chalkboard, but we'll, we'll do this without a chalkboard. Um, you have to think of every phrase that you play, right? Think of it as being a whole note in terms of your air. You know what I mean by that? So when you say, right? I'm not going, not cutting it off. The only difference is what I'm doing is I'm allowing my tongue to slice the air like butter. Right? So then you get that smooth flow. All right? So try it. Try it. Just play the melody. Now don't, now don't, just think about it. Don't, don't come. Don't okay. Now automatically you sound a lot better. Y'all can, can hear the difference, right? Uh, now here's the thing though. <clears throat> Stop thinking about those notes. You hit that F, and then when you went to that E, you say, oh, I got to go up and hit this E. Mm -hmm. So you cut that F, you cut the note off, cut the air off on the F. Ah, uh -huh. just... Hit him hard and wish him well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, now one more thing. Good. Now, what you're doing is you're playing stronger. But here's what I want you to try now. What produces the sound on the trumpet? Thank you not the tongue, right? So don't hammer the notes with your tongue. You don't have to do that. What you do is you put a little pulsation on the air if you want to accent. That's old Freddie Hubbard trick. Watch this. When I do this, all of my tongue is going to be the same. It's all air. So now play it again, lighten up on your tongue, use more air. Ah, see, okay, now, right. Now you saw how you cracked that E? That's because you're so used to going dot with your tongue. Now you see where you gotta tighten your corners and use more air so you can lighten up on that tongue. There's a lot more stuff to practice, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Start that list. There you go. <laughs> no, but that's cool. But you see, you see what that'll help you out a great deal. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, <laughs> Wesley Meyer. Now let me ask. It's a it's a master class for listeners too. So let me ask you this. Uh, I heard what you said about even notes. Yes. Um, which I don't know may have something to do. Here. Sure. Thank you. Which uh -huh. may have something to do with. I'm thinking of Latin music and how much of it has, how its influence has grown. And you think of those even eighth notes with mm -hmm. a lot of Latin rhythm. Mm -hmm. But when I hear you, I hear players in your band. I hear all kinds of players who play in that even way, but mm -hmm. still it swings. Yes, there, there's, and, and the thing for that, that comes from the drummer. 
Uh. But if they start, if they play straight, if they take out, it's all the accents. Ting, 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 If they go ting, 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 that stays even. You know, and the hi hat. Ting, 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 ting. That's what makes it swing. Any music, you think about it, even dance music, right? It's that that it's the it's the it's the consistency of the beat is what gives you the groove, right? All of the other stuff is called style. Right, <laughs> swing is a style, as exactly. they always say. Exactly. Um, but it's in, but you're saying especially for the fundamentals, right? You want to keep it straight. Well, you got to keep it straight because you know you want to be. That's how you're going to develop your phrase and develop your technique, you know, and develop. And, and as a as a as a uh, uh, the other point about that is that, you know, uh, you also develop good time. Uh -huh. You develop right. good time. You right. know, one of the things people always say, say, man, you play, you have good time, man. And I said, well, that's because, you know, I spent a lot of time practicing my stuff to be even. You know those, uh, those uh, Herbert L. Clark technical studies? They did it out, right? We used to practice those with jazz phrasing. Went and myself, we always used to do that when we were kids. And when we practiced it with jazz phrasing, we used the metronome. And we didn't go. Yeah, we didn't do that. I see. Yeah. It's good. See, I'm glad I asked. Um, <laughs> Norberto Mexicanos was born and raised in Alexandria, Virginia. He's been playing trumpet since the age of nine. His grandmother gave him his first trumpet when he was in the fourth grade. In the sixth grade, a new teacher started a jazz big band and introduced him to the world of jazz. He's in his third semester at Howard University. Please welcome Norberto Mexicanos. Oh. Okay. You want me to play on it? It's okay, man. Let's right. play with a big sound. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the first thing that I'm hearing with you, there's a, obviously you studied the language a bit, right? So the, one of the things that I'm hearing with you, like if you were at the Monk Institute, the first thing I'll start dealing with with you is fundamentals. Right. Fundamentals. Because here's the first thing. You're holding back on your air. You're saying, duh, 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 duh. you're trying to be so controlled with it, right? That's the reason why you have to really get this together, the corner thing. Like with Clark Terry, man, he always said, man, 
he used to work on his corner so tight, felt like he could bite on a brick. You know what I mean? And if you, don't worry, man. And I'm happily married, so it's okay. But feel that. You feel that? Yeah. It's pretty hard, right? Right? <laughs> okay. You want to you want to make sure that that's strong so that it controls the air because you want your air to be like a water nozzle. Okay. You know you know when you have that back pressure coming through, it'll just go all over the place. But if the water nozzle is there and it's really strong, it can direct it. Okay. Now hold up your horn. Let me show you something. When you play a note, as soon as you take in a breath, from the very first note, your air starts to go this way. And all of those notes go out further this way. So you got to constantly use more air with the phrase until you take in another breath. Okay. All right? So I want you to play that melody again, right? The way you did. And think about going. Now, so I'm not telling you to play loud. I'm just telling you to be open. OK? Sure, no, I understand. Okay, stop. I'm not gonna stop you right there. Now, one of the reasons why you're having this problem is because you gotta take in more air. You can't dispel what you don't have. Alright. Okay? So, what's the best way to take in the air? Breathe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you go steal an oxygen tank someplace. Uh, no, when you, <clears throat> a lot of people think that taking in air, you're taking in, <clears throat> I can't take in any air right now, um, into your chest, or you, you know, no, right. The best way to monitor to breathe, your breathing, next time you yawn, when you yawn, that's the perfect way to breathe. When you go, <sighs> chest, your shoulders don't go anywhere, it's all in your lungs. Right? So what you need to do is you need to practice taking in air 10 times before you play. Right. You know? Let me see you do that. Yeah, see, I heard more coming out than going in. Right? Don't be afraid. Yeah, expand that gut. You're a little guy. You don't have one of these. <laughs> You're OK. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right, so the first time I started doing this, I actually started to get sleepy. <laughs> you know, because it's kind of a meditative type of thing when you think about it. You know what I'm saying? All right, so play it again. Now, in this time, and, and, and here's the other key, too. You, once, you, once you work on taking in your air, you also have to learn how to take in air in rhythm. Right? So that can. You see how I took that breath in? So it has to be in rhythm with the music. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Come on. Uh, yeah, we're good. So now you know, so do it. <laughs> I'm just joking, man. My bad. Yeah, that's cool, man. <laughs> Got to get you in the habit of taking it. Can you see how he's not taking in a lot of air? See now they they, they not even trumpet players. Right? <laughs> okay, but here's the here's the thing. Because what I what I see you doing is a, is a normal thing, and it's very good because we need to point it out. It's a normal thing some trumpet players do. You take in the air, and then there's a momentary pause before you go back out because you're trying to set your chops, uh -huh. right? So you gotta oh, your lips. I'm sorry for the lay people <laughs> out there. <clears throat> uh, so what you have to do is. You have to practice going, <sighs> all right? So I'm going to give you an exercise to do that. I want you to play from, <clears throat> da, what is that? Is that a G? Da, 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 da. All right, I was close enough. OK, um, so I want you to play from G, F sharp, G, F, G, E, G, D. You skip the E flat, OK? Now, when you do that, I want you to do it without the tongue. It's called a high attack. All right. Okay, try that. So, so hit every note with that. Yes, you're gonna you're gonna slur from the first one all the way down, okay. but the first note is, is high, high. yeah. Okay, okay. Now you're gonna stop on the D. Do it again and do it slow. Okay, do 
it soft, soft. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's do it on the C above that. Same, just transpose it up a four. Do it again, do it again. Transpose it up a, ma a major third to the E. Soft, softer, softer. Okay, now let's go back and play that melody. Give him a copy yeah. of this so he can. Now, is it me? Or did y'all hear the difference? Yep. Absolutely. That's just with doing this within two minutes. So that's again, that's the thing, like doing it in two minutes, multiply that by practicing a certain amount of time a day. Okay. Norberto right. Mexicanos, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Good. Man. Thank you. But the other thing, the other thing, before, before you go, there's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, I'm sorry. The other thing is, also, you're going to have to work on your lip flexibilities, right. right? Because what you're doing when you're improvising, you're, you're trying to hit all of these notes, right? But you got to train your embouchure to move that way, right? So in order to do that, you have to do lip flexibility. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, all of that. Right? And that's going to allow you to gain clarity along with this breathing exercise. Because this is going to allow you to become more accurate in terms of hitting the center of all of those notes. Right now, you're not hitting the center of them because your embouchure is not strong enough. Right? So you have to do those daily drills that are boring, but they're like curls. They're like, seriously, they're like curls for your. Okay. <laughs> but they like curls, okay? All right, cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. It, it's amazing because you really, this is why it's a master class, folks. I mean, you hear an instant change in the sound, improvement in the sound. Well, the thing is, it's like fundamental stuff, you know, and some, the unfortunate thing is that playing the trumpet is a very simple matter. It's, again, it goes back to that whole mental aspect of it. The, the, the mind is the thing. My trumpet teacher always say playing the trumpet is like 90% mental. You know, because the physical thing we, 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 we learn, but then we forget. You know, we don't pay attention to it. But when you start to deal with the fundamentals, and the thing about it for you guys, you got to make the fundamentals habit. You got to make it habit. I've seen Clark Terry play. He takes in the breath, man, even when he's not even thinking about it. It's just part of his being. It's just part of what he does daily, and that's why he's so great. And, it, you know, I'll tell you another story. I, I, I interviewed Kenny Burrell, the great guitarist, one time, and I noticed his breathing. Mm -hmm. He's a guitar player, right. right? Right. So I asked him about his, first of all, it made me look good because I asked a very hip question. You know? <laughs> but I said, uh, I said, tell me about your breathing. He says, oh, he says, you notice that. He said, yeah, well, he says, I always try to breathe with my phrasing. Right. And, you know, it, it because... It's a different part of your body, that you're, right. but your body is ultimately the instrument, right? Well, the reason, the, reason, the reason for it with pianists and guitarists is because they will play like run-ons if they don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if they don't. <laughs> and I've seen it. You know, I've, I did a session with a pianist who didn't breathe. Man, and me and Bradford, we were on a session, man. And we, <laughs> we couldn't play none of the music, man. The, the lines were... It was one of those kind of things. So when you start to breathe, you start to act like a vocalist. And you start to have pauses. You start, your sentences start to have periods. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. The, um, 
The other thing I was going to add from the theater is that when you teach actors how to breathe, <clears throat> it's called sleep breathing. Hmm. If you, if you, the way, a, 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 I remember Pavarotti giving a master class one time, we talked about it, he said, look at a baby when he's crying. A baby cry all night, nobody's stopping. Right. And it's always from here, right. it's always. And it's the way most people normally breathe when they're asleep. So try to look at yourself next time you're sleeping. <laughs> but um, actually the exercise that they used to give me is, you lie down and put a book on your chest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And just breathe. If the book moves, you're doing you're it doing wrong. wrong. You know? <laughs> Um, okay, and our last lucky student, um, DeAndre Schaefer was born in Gary, Indiana, and has okay. lived in the D.C. area for six years. <laughs> Let's give it up for Gary. Uh, <laughs> lived in the D.C. area for six years. While living in D.C., DeAndre completed his bachelor's in jazz studies from UDC in 2004, as well as participated in Betty Carter's Jazz Ahead in 2003. He subscribes, I'm sorry, he, it says prescribes, he wants to be, a, aspires, I think is what we wanted, a lifelong student of music, apropos of uh, what Terrence said before. Please welcome DeAndre Schaefer. Very nice. Pretty. Pretty, man. Pretty. Pretty. Now, you got a very nice dark kind of tone, right? Really smooth kind of sound, right? One of the things I would tell you is the same thing I was telling my man, air. That's one of the things I'm hearing. You should work on your, 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 the, the size of your air column. Because you notice when you went up to that, 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 that the, the higher note the, the first time, you kind of missed it, right? It was all, the only reason why you miss it is because it wasn't there. It's just very simple, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna tell you this, uh, this goes for all the trumpet players. I have my student in, in uh, New Orleans doing this, you know, you gotta exercise. You got to. You know, Miles boxed, Wynton and Freddie play basketball, I box, you know, we exercise. And the reason for that is because it helps you to build your wind column. It helps. My student in, the, in New Orleans right now at the Monk Institute, he's been jogging. He's been doing, and he's about this tall. He's been, really, he's been like that. And uh, he's been jogging like uh, three miles a day. And it's helped his sound. Because when you exercise, when you start to build up that wind column, 
man, you'll see. When I started boxing, man, my sound changed. It changed because, you know, in the ring, somebody's beating, beating the hell out of you and you're trying to gasp for air, you know, <laughs> all of that. Once that becomes stronger and becomes bigger, as soon as you go, <sighs> so now you're playing with a bigger wind column. Now, the thing is, it's not about playing loud. It's not what I'm asking. It's about playing full, okay? So now I'm gonna give you an example. I want you to play that melody again, right? But this time, I want you to think of playing with a bigger wind column. Let's say like your air's like this, the last time you played, right? I want you to think of it being like that, okay? All right, so taking more air. That means taking in more air all the time. I'm gonna do the same thing I did to him, okay? All right, stop. You sound different already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From the very first note, right? It's fatter. You sound different already. All right, let's go again. So you just shucking and jiving the first time. <laughs> 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 Come up here with all that mess. Man, come on and play this, man. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Okay, now, now we get to that. You see when you did that? Right? That's where you're going to have to work on your flexibility and tightening your corners. Because sometimes the, the you never, you ever heard that saying, you know, old folks used to say the devil's in the details? Right, that's what you gotta work on now, it's the details. Cause you got a nice sound and you got a good grasp of the language. It's the details. So now that means you gotta work on your flexibility, get those corners tight. So when you play in those lines and you play in those, those ideas, you're not fluffing them. That all of your air is directed and it's, you're doing it in a very controlled manner. Right? Do you, do you know, uh, let me see. Uh, all right, just just improvise on the on the same tune. Okay, now all right. I, I hate to do this as a jazz artist, but you heard that first phrase you played. Can you play it again? Yeah. All right. Now this time when you play it, when you get down to the bottom of that phrase, give that phrase just as much air as the first part. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all right, that's all right, that's all right. But are you, this just going the same direction. So like if you go, when you go down to that lower register, mm -hmm. make sure you give me more air down there. Because what I'm hearing, this is what happens, this is what it sounds like. Da 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 So it's like the, what happens is, you don't, brass players don't realize is that the middle core of where everything feels comfortable is the loudest part of everything you play. You dig what I mean? So when we get to the lower register, the volume comes back a bit, so you don't have this evenness of sound, right? You want to have evenness of sound until you don't want to play even. You don't want to just be that way just because that's the way you play all the time. You want to be able to do both things. You know what I'm saying? So like when I'm playing, I want my sound to be even. I'm making sure that I'm giving that lower part more air so that it will speak unless I don't want that. Right? But that's not going to, I'm not going to have the, I'm not going to do the same thing all the time, is what I'm saying. So you need to have the ability to, to vary it. All right, so now play it again. And when you get down to that little register, man, come on, give me some air. You just proved you can do it now. Right. Oh, man, come on now. There you go. <laughs> you saw how when you, y'all you, heard that? Yep. You hit that E flat down there and it spoke. So now, what does that mean? That goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's mental. You can, you already can do it. You're just not thinking about it. Right? So go back and start thinking about it. You want to be even from bottom to top. Even from bottom to top. Even in time, even in sound. Right? until you don't want to play even. 
You dig what I'm saying? You just don't want to be that guy that does that all the time because when you do that, they check out <laughs> because there's no surprise. You're predictable, right? You don't want to be predictable. What you want to do is you want to take them on a journey. And the only way to do that is you got to have as many variables in your bag as possible because you want to go. It's like boxing. Boom. Throw a jab, throw a jab, throw a jab. Yeah, throw a jab. I'm going to fake a jab, not nah, throw a left. Bam. You don't want to throw jabs all night. OK? All right, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, DeAndre, DeAndre Schaefer. <clears throat> so one, one thing that occurred to me, and, and especially, and I wasn't even going to ask it until you said, it is a lot of it's mental. I don't know if this is fundamentals or if this comes later in one's development as an artist, but, um, and I'm, it's also a self-serving question as a lyricist. Does knowing the lyrics of the song help? Oh, a great deal. It helps a great deal, you know, because you have to, you have to, you, you're trying to tell a story. And that's what, what he's talking about is what I was trying to explain to you guys earlier about it not just being about music, it's about being about life. You know, last, I was telling him earlier last night when Raul Madan sang uh, Change Is Gonna Come, I got very emotional listening to those words. You know, when he gets to the bridge and he says, and I went to my brother and I said, brother, help me please. You know what I mean? That stuff, you know, hit me hard. Plus his performance of it. And that's when music to me becomes magic and is very magical and powerful. Yeah. And, and, and if you were to play Change Is Gonna Come as an instrumental, it would now be informed by that lyrical performance. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right. Um, also, very often, I find that uh, and some people are very orthodox about that. Uh, uh, I remember Jimmy Heath saying, yes, absolutely, you should know the words of every... And it, he said it also helps you remember changes if you know the lyric. But then he says there are other people like Johnny Griffin. He doesn't want to know the lyric. He doesn't want to, you know, and he plays gorgeous ballads and everything else. But very often, as listeners, I think, even dedicated jazz listeners who are into the music, very often sometimes, you know, the lyric is sneaking into our head as we're listening. So if you're aware of it, it, it helps us too, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, I just talked to Herbie the other day, man. Herbie, we were having this conversation about this last record that he did with Joni Mitchell's music. Yeah. And uh, he said for the first time he had done something with this album that he's never done before, which is to have all of the musicians not only learn the lyrics, but they actually sat down and discuss the meanings wow. and the stories of every song before wow. they recorded them. And it's important with her, you know, any kind of <coughs> singer song, but especially Joni Mitchell. Well, speaking of what the audience has in its minds, um, it's now a chance for you to speak, and I'll try and repeat and or paraphrase the questions as best I can, so our uh, online listeners and viewers can understand the questions. Well, any questions for Terence Blanchard? Yes, sir. What was the transition like from wanting to be Miles Davis to the realization that he had to be himself? Frankly, I mean, it, it was depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it was us, man. It was depressing because, you know, then your first, th your first question is, is who am I? You know, and, and it's a scary thing uh, uh, because you have to really do some self-examination. I feel blessed to have done it because then I started to realize there's so many people in life who don't know who they are. You know, but I, I feel uh, uh, great to have done it. But I had to start willing away at the things that I knew that I liked. You know, I had to start saying, well, yeah, well, well, yeah, well, Miles probably wouldn't do that, but I dig that. You know what I'm saying? And then, I, by the grace of God, I met a lot of my heroes that, you know, just confirmed my notions. Because Herbie would say, life is full of choices. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about making a choice. And when he said that to me, I went, wow. Then Wayne said something to me about, he told me this story about this, this musician who was having problems and uh, her mother told her, you know, it takes courage to be happy. And uh, when he said that, that hit me really hard because I'm like, yeah, it takes courage to just go out there and do what you do. Because let's face some facts. You know, I don't care what people say, what people will say, but you know, we all want to be loved. We all want to be liked. We all want to be appreciated, right? 
So for some of us, it's a very scary thing to sit down and work on something that's totally unique, totally us, only to present it to the public to have you reject it. You know what I mean? Not to say that that will happen, because nine times out of 10, if it's really sincere, you're gonna get it anyway. But we don't know that, you know, you know, when you're young, you don't know that. It's much easier for me to play like Clifford Brown because I know most people love Clifford Brown, you know? So the, the process was, was a hard one, and I still feel like I'm in the midst of it, frankly. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm in the midst of it. You know, people will say, man, I heard this movie and I knew it was you. And I go, well, okay, thank you. And that's a great compliment. But um, I don't know what those things are that people hear because I still feel that way. I still feel like I'm trying to find out what it is that I like. Because, you know, there's some things I like today and I may not like them tomorrow. You know, but it makes life interesting and it makes playing music fun. What was it you said a little... Right at the beginning of the afternoon, something about buying records or selling or something. I mean, it, uh, ours, it seems to me, and, you know, have at this as well, it's ours as a time when you're sort of discouraged from knowing who you are. Your sort of marketers want to put you in this category or that category. You're this or you're that. And uh, It's hard. That, yeah. I mean, there's, first of all, there's the first thing of learning the language. So when you're learning the language, you're constantly dealing with somebody else's art. And then, you know, if you're blessed enough or lucky enough to get into the business, then you have to deal with the marketing thing. You know, then people are saying, oh, he's, when we first hit the scene, man, it was crazy. You know, because people kept telling us what we weren't. You know, oh, he's not Miles Davis, he's not Freddie Hubbard, he's not this. You know, and it, which was crazy because, you know, at that particular moment we started to learn that we shouldn't be that and we didn't want to be that. So it was kind of confusing for us a little bit. Um, but now you pe hear people talk about that a lot, so I feel sorry for some of the younger guys coming on the scene because they always compare to, well, he's the next this and he's the next that. And I think it does a disservice to them, you know, and to the public, frankly, because then you s you're setting up expect listening expectations, right. you know, as opposed to just saying, well, this guy has something unique and just let pe allow people to check it out for themselves and make their own decisions. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. So how did you learn, I guess, the language? Did transcription of people's solos and that stuff help? How did you do it? Well, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you transcribe to understand how things were used. You know, sometimes I, I would hear things on record, and I go, wow, what was that, man? And I go back and I transcribe it, and then I break it down technically or theoretically in my mind and say, okay, oh, that was this. He, oh, he went up a minor fourth against this chord here, or he used this type of scale here or that, right? And then I would practice it. You know, and then I would try to use it on the gig. You know, the problem is, is that it never worked for me trying to use it on the gig because my emotions would take over. My emotions would say, well, look, well, why don't we play this, you know? And whenever I tried to play something that I practiced like that, man, it was the worst solos I've ever taken in my life. <laughs> but that just becomes a thing where I think you have to familiarize yourself with, with what it is that you've learned, absorb it, and let it inspire your own ideas, you know, based on your own musical personality. Don't feel that there's going to be this magical moment when somebody's going to come down and dub you, you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, you have, to, you have to kind of do both things, you know, throughout the entire process. That's been my experience. You know, when I was taking off Clifford Brown solos, I would take those things off and I couldn't play them. I mean, I, c I could play them technically. I learned the solos, you know, and they helped me inform me of how to play changes. But when I would play them on the gigs, it wouldn't work. So when I started just trying to go for my own, I was making a lot of mistakes. But I was making a lot of mistakes in that language of what it was that I was learning. You know what I mean? So I didn't realize at the time, I was so consumed with not making mistakes, I didn't realize that the transcriptions were definitely helping me. You see, you see what I mean? Because they were showing me the path. They were showing me a way to, 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 to approach it. I hope I'm making sense. Was that a daily practice? Or is that like you just heard a line? You're like, oh, let me get that line. Or were you like every day I want to transcribe stuff? No, I didn't transcribe stuff every day. No, no. Because uh, for, me, I, for me, I like to absorb things. I, you know, 
that's the type of person that I am. You know, it drives my wife nuts. You know, because I'll listen to the same song. Well, good thing she we weren't dating back then, because I know she probably wouldn't be with me now. But I, I would I would listen to like the same thing over and over and over again, because I was just so fascinated by it. And for me back then, I was trying to figure out what jazz was. So I would listen to the solo, then I listened to the piano, then I listened to the bass, and then I listened to the drums. I was just obsessed with it, you know, and I'm the same way now. So I didn't transcribe every day. I tried to really absorb what it is that I was dealing with at that time. It's a great story that you may know, forgive me one second, about uh, Wes Montgomery, who memorized, I can't imagine two musicians more different than the guitarists Charlie Christian and Wes Montgomery, but Wes Montgomery memorized some Charlie, like three or four Charlie Christian solos from his Benny Goodman days and went to a club in Indianapolis, played it, everybody screamed and cheered, wanted more, and he had to play the same solos again, and yeah, eventually right, right, right. he had to go home and learn how to play so that he could play his own stuff. Right. You know? Well, you know, you know what's funny about that? I, I was in a pop band when, uh, when I was a kid, and man, we were practicing for this talent show. And we, we practiced these two songs for this talent show. You know, it was an R&B funk band, man. Right. We got to the talent show, man, and we played the hell out of these Turned two songs. Man, and it was great. <laughs> Next thing you know, the woman said, play another one. <laughs> right. And we were on stage like, uh... Right. Play what? <laughs> yeah. Yes, fun. sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. This is the question about um, Terrence's new and just this week, or last week, four days ago, uh, double Grammy-nominated album, A Tale of God's Will, A Requiem for Katrina, and the second cut on the CD. Which is actually Which nominated. That's, like the that's, that's, the, that's nominated yeah. for Best Instrumental Solo, yeah, right? The yeah, Levy's. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that's one of those things, and I'll speak to you guys about that. That's one of those things where life becomes a big part of what it is you do it. Uh, uh, as an artist, you know, um, as you know, I'm from New Orleans and played a big role in doing, you know, uh, making that documentary with Spike. Um, and when it came time to record that music, man, I had, we, I had already heard so many stories from different people about what they had gone through. You know, when went in the, in the Lincoln Center and they did the, the benefit, the higher ground thing uh, for all of the New Orleans musicians, uh, it was amazing because there were so many musicians from New Orleans there, man, and I don't think any of us saw the show live because we were all backstage asking each other the same questions, like, how are you doing? What happened to your home? When are you going back? Is everybody cool? Where's your family? Is everybody all right? Those were the, that, was the, you know, that was the mantra that you heard from everybody throughout the entire night. Um, then, you know, going back to New Orleans, and then uh, uh, on that particular thing, Levy's, there was a, there was a gentleman that I... I seen in all of all places of Baskin Robbins. <laughs> I was with my little girls, they wanted ice cream, so we go into this Baskin Robbins and this guy comes in and he recognized me and, and we started talking and he was telling me, he was 73 years old and he was telling me how during a hurricane he was stuck on his roof for three days with two women who were 72 years old. Mm. And he said the water was up to the roof and they were on the, you know, the pitch of this roof and it was difficult for him. So the 73-year-old man jumped in the water and swam and he saw this canoe. He went and brought the canoe back to his house and tied it up to the edge of the house just so the women could have something level to sit in. They weren't trying to leave because, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't see any sense in that. He said he just sat there until res you know, the rescuers, rescuers would come. He said it was frustrating because they heard helicopters flying overhead, you know, the whole, the whole time. And he said in the middle of the day that the sun off the water was extremely hot. So I'm sitting there listening to that, and he said the thing that was really out about it is that you could see other people on other roofs stuck in the neighborhood. So, you know, when I'm playing that arrangement, right, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm feeling that. And, 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 and there's a certain type of outrage, there's a certain type of frustration, and a, there's a certain type of, of uh, just sorrow that I feel whenever I think about that. So when it came time to write the, the arrangements, if you listen to Levy's, the, the, it starts out with the strings, right? Well, the strings represent the water that that guy was talking about. 
how the water was everywhere. He said it was everywhere, you know? So as he's talking about it, right, I'm, uh, as the strings go on, I'm trying to create a scenario by which you guys hear that or feel that, you know? And then when the band comes in, the band to me kind of represents just the whole notion of people wanting to be rescued and not being rescued, to be on a roof for three or four days in a situation like that. And then the trumpet represents people screaming for help and not being heard. So, so you know, that's what I thought about when I made that arrangement, you know. And it's one of those things, like I was telling you guys, it's not, it's, it's, it's not numbers. It's not chord changes. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not rhythms. It's life. It's real life. And your music has to reflect what happens in your life. You know what I'm saying? It's like the wildest thing for me to be nominated for a Grammy for this particular CD because I don't feel like it's mine. I don't, I don't feel like this CD is mine. I feel like this CD is just a reflection of what all of the people that I've known or the people that I've experienced have gone through through this episode, this particular point of our history. You know what I mean? It's, you know, that's why I wrote in the, on the CD there, there are three pieces called Ghost, and, and a ghost of Congo Square, a ghost of 1927, and a ghost of Betsy. Because I really feel like you know, there are these spirits that are helping us to get through this. <coughs> you know what I mean? Uh, last night when we performed it, <coughs> uh, I, don't th it's, I don't know how to explain it, but you don't think about music. You know what I'm saying? In, in that situation. Music is the last thing on my mind. It's not about, let me play this hip substitution over this chord. No, that doesn't have anything to do with it. My mind goes back to that little guy in that Baskin Robbins telling me how he was stuck on his roof for three days. I mean, I'd argue not to, you know, just glad hand, but also the whole piece endows those stories with such a nobility and mm. such, I mean, it's clearly filtered through your art and mm. Grammy nominations or no Grammy nominations, there's, there's a reason you got them, you know mm, what I'm saying? Thank you, thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's a question about the audience. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, I know where you're going with that. <laughs> well, it's always funny, man, but I'm, I'm kind of used to that, being from New Orleans, you know. And, uh, I'll give you an example. Years ago, even, I mean, I, I was playing in L.A., and I, I've always played like some kind of New Orleans type of thing at the end of my shows, where it'd be a second line or something like that. And I just do it because I love doing it. You know, I'm going to have fun. <laughs> you know, I, I try to get people involved, and I think people were just a little reserved last night, but that's okay. That's just part of our culture, you know, being from New Orleans. And it was funny, man. I remember doing this thing in LA and uh, playing at this club, and the club was packed full of people. And we're doing this thing, the drummer, he was Troy Davis. He was actually from Baton Rouge. So he's hitting that street beat, and we're doing the thing, boom, 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 boom. And this one guy in the front, man, he couldn't help it. He pulled out his handkerchief, nah. he jumped out, <laughs> and he started doing his thing. Man, and I was like, go ahead, dog, dance. Go ahead, do your thing. <laughs> And, uh, and the people in the crowd, they looked at us like we were crazy. crazy. I, know, I know they thought it was part of the show, but we were just having a good time. And I, th I think it's, it's fine. You know, it, I, th I think some, some people are just not uh, accustomed to, to, to that. And, and the constant reminder of that for me is when people come down to visit New Orleans. They come down to visit New Orleans and lose their minds. Yep. Yeah. You know, they get down there and they say, oh my God. I had one friend, man, who came down she came down for one day, hung out with me and my wife and some friends and everything, and she told me, she said, don't ever do that to me again. It took me a week to recover. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of New Orleans is alive and well. The other thing is, don't forget the setting. It's, uh, it's the Kennedy Center, you know, and often people say, oh, I'm in the Kennedy Center now. I have to comport myself in such a way, you know, and it's, it's a larger question. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Oh, I have a lot Advice of... Advice for young trumpet players. How long have you been playing? So this will be one and a half months. <laughs> uh, do you have a teacher? 
Okay, first thing, listen to everything your teacher tells you to do. That's number one. Don't think that they, I'm gonna tell, and I'm just gonna say this to you. Don't think that your teacher's gonna tell you anything to hurt you or anything that you shouldn't be doing. Listen, that's the number one thing. Listen to everything you, that your teacher tells you to do. Do you play a sport? Um, yeah, How often do you play basketball? Do you, are you pretty good at it? Yeah. <laughs> What's your position? Uh, don't know yet. <laughs> okay. Huh? You're the center? So that means you're getting them rebounds and scoring and stuff? Okay, now, the reason why I ask that is because you see how when you practice, you start to get better because you do it every Monday and every Wednesday, right? You have to learn the plays. You have to learn how to dribble. I know you have those dribbling exercises where you go up and down the court, right? So with the trumpet, you're going to have to play it every day. You're going to have to play it every day because you're trying to develop muscles. The biggest tip that I would ever give you is that realize that playing the trumpet is like being an athlete in that you have to train. You have to train your mus muscles to become stronger, right? And to do what it is you need them to do. You know, when you start to shoot foul shots, if this arm isn't strong, you're not gonna shoot any, you're not gonna make any shots. You have to make sure that this arm is strong. So you do that by building up, by shooting foul shots. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm left-handed. I wondered about that shot. Dan, now you're talking. There you go. The I'm follow through. Man. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So make sure that you practice and play every day and make sure you do exactly what your teachers told you to do. And the other thing, I know you're young, but when you can and when it's available to you, go out and listen to some live music as much as you can. Okay? Cool. So I'm going to see you at my next show. <laughs> <laughs> We, we uh, held this show over for a little bit longer than we were supposed to, but I just want to thank all of you, uh, listeners and players as well. I want to thank our three wonderful young trumpet players for sharing. This is a hard thing to do. It takes some courage to get up here naked and put your lips to some steel and try and make more brass or whatever it is and try to make people happy. And I want to thank the master of the oh, master class, you. Terrence Planter. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.